This social studies lesson is part of a series on American history. This is the first lesson in the series in which we're going to look at the first inhabitants in the modern day United States. So some questions that we may be bringing to this lesson. Who was here first? What were their settlements like? What was their culture? And what happened to them? Now, studying Native Americans is not easy. There's some complications. First of all, cultures were oral, not written. That means they were passed down through stories, through songs, even through dances. But most Native Americans did not have written languages. This poses a problem when you're trying to study them. Most of our information comes from educated assumptions based on what evidence we have and from non-native observers, in other words, Europeans. Those observers had certain biases. Oftentimes they didn't really understand the cultures they were talking about. We also have a problem that many native cultures didn't stay put. A lot of the cultures moved around. Now some of them were fully nomadic, meaning they just kept moving, and some native cultures were semi-nomadic meaning that they would have a winter area where they lived and then a summer area where they lived. Some of them moved around all four seasons. So that's a little bit problematic when you're trying to study them because all the information isn't conveniently in one place. Now another problem is Europeans tended not to value native cultures. So they often destroyed cultural sites and artifacts, they raided graves, and they didn't bother to learn the languages a lot of early information has been lost permanently because of this. Also, Americans, including historians, have a tendency to infantilize, which means to make someone childlike in your assumptions, or de-civilize, dehumanize, sometimes idolize native cultures. So there's a lot of bias, whether negative or positive, that can get in the way. The native cultures were not savages, but they also weren't perfect angels. They were human beings with all the complications that come with that. So many of our ideas are just that, they're our ideas. And often they're our ideas from hundreds or even a thousand years later. So we can't be 100% accurate on a lot of things regarding Native Americans before the Europeans arrived and even after the Europeans arrived. Now, for the purpose of this lesson, we're just looking at cultures within the continuous United States, present day United States. Obviously, at the time of Native Americans prior to Europeans arriving on the continent, it didn't look like this. So you didn't have these neat little states all formed. In fact, it looked more like this. All of these different overlapping colors are different native nations, different groups of people. And you can see there's so many of them that you can't even distinguish where one ends and the next begins. I mean, this is messy human history. Sometimes nations of Native Americans would take over other nations. Sometimes they stole each other's lands, just like with Europeans. So we don't have a neat, tidy map. Now what I can tell you is that frequently settlements would be close to bodies of water, just like in other parts of the world. Rivers in particular form a natural, easy way of getting from one place to another. So you tend to find a lot of cultures around water. So what did they leave behind? What did they leave that we could study to learn about them? Well, one thing they left is geoglyphs. This is not a term that you need to know for the GED exam, it's just something interesting. So what on earth is a geoglyph? They are works of art, like large designs or motifs, sometimes even an image, like a human or a buffalo, that were made from moving or arranging stones or earth or other objects within a landscape. So oftentimes these are huge. 
Geoglyphs can also be things like burial mounds or other landscape alterations that form a pattern or a picture when you see them from the air. And don't worry, I'm going to show you some examples. They're awesome. And what makes them so cool is we don't know how people predicted or knew how to make the patterns or pictures that they wanted to make because they didn't have airplanes. They didn't have a way of getting super high up in the air. So how did they create these things that can only really be seen and appreciated from the air? We'll never know. Typically these were formed by rocks or similarly durable elements of the landscape, stones, stone fragments, live trees, gravel, earth itself. And again, these are typically large. Geoglyphs are usually longer than 13 feet and some of them can be hundreds of feet. What's known as a positive geoglyph is something that's built above the ground. A negative geoglyph is carved into the ground, like carved into the hillside exposing bedrock. And these, by the way, are not just found in the United States. They're found worldwide. Very famously over in Britain, there is a um, hillside that has this giant horse carved into it. Um, there's another one that's this giant man carved into a hill you may have seen pictures of before. So these are found around the world, including around the present day United States. Um, Blythe Giants is a series of geoglyphs that you can see today in California. And if you look at this lighter colored dirt on the ground, it actually forms a human figure. I'm gonna show you another angle of Blythe Giants. And you see the humanoid figure carved into the side of this hill. I mean, it's huge. We have no idea why they made it. We don't know if it was meant to represent a god. That's always the assumption, but it could just be an image that they thought looked cool. We have no idea. Effigy mounds in Iowa, all those things in white are human made shapes. And some of them look kind of like airplanes. They're probably supposed to be birds, but of course there's conspiracy theorists that have come up with other ideas. Here's another section of effigy mounds, all these animal-like figures. We don't know the purpose. Why were they made? Or here's the Great Serpent Mound in Ohio. So if you look at the grass, see that serpent-like shape? You have to look kind of close to see it. That's man-made. Nature didn't make that. Why did they do it? Again, we don't know. Something else they left behind is evidence of their agriculture. So what do we know about the sorts of agricultural societies that developed? Well, we do know that maize appears to be the first crop farmed in the present day US, maize being a type of corn. Maize farming spread northward from Mexico, which is where it originated, arrived in the Southwest United States roughly around 1000 BCE. So a long time ago, over 3,000 years ago. The Mogollon, I'm sorry, I'm butchering the pronunciation, who lived in the Arizona-New Mexico border area were probably the first what we would call American farmers, as in farmers within the present day United States. They farmed maize, beans, and squash, and they stored their food in storage pits within permanent settlements. Interestingly, most native cultures that farmed in the United States would farm maize, beans, and squash together. They called them the three sisters. Multiple cultures called them that. And what's fascinating about it is each of those crops benefits the other two. So the beans actually add nutrients to the soil that benefits the squash and the corn forms a nice stalk that the beans can grow up because beans like to vine and grow up things. So what this reveals to us is that they understood companion planting. Hohokam was a contemporary culture in southern Arizona. Contemporary meaning it emerged right around the same time as the Mogollon people. They built the very first irrigation system that we know of north of Mexico, which channeled water through 500 miles of canals to enable them to farm in the desert. 
So as you can see, these early native societies were able to adapt their environment to their own needs. This is some Mogollon pottery that's been found. So this is from a very, very early culture and you can see different depictions of animals on this particular set of pottery. This is a little bit of a city from Hohokam. Some different structures that they built. Now obviously that little pavilion with the roof, that's modern. That was put there to try to protect these. These have been exposed to the elements for over a thousand years and that's why they've broken down so much. This is an artist depiction of what the Hohokam's main city probably looked like. And it's based on evidence in the geological record. So in other words, evidence from looking at stone, looking at ruins and predicting. So it may have looked like this. It may have looked a little bit different. This is our best educated guess. We do know that there was farmland all around. And here again, this is from studying the geology of the area. We do have evidence that they played some sort of ball game. We don't know what it was or what the rules were, but there are pieces left over, including what was probably a ball court where this game was played. Another culture is the Anasazi culture. So the Anasazis are so cool because they were cliff dwellers. You can see a picture of their bits of their civilization that still remain. They were located in what's known as the Four Corners area, where Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado meet. And this dates back to the first century. This is probably the best known Southwestern farming culture. They originally dwelt in pit house villages that they dug, but they upgraded to these densely populated multi-story, basically apartment complexes, what are known as pueblos, around 750. They occupied a very large area. We know today of more than 25,000 Anasazi communities just in New Mexico alone. So they were a widespread, full culture. Pueblo Benito in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, is considered the Anasazi's golden age achievement. It's a complex of 700 interconnected rooms. It's giant and amazing, and you can actually go there today and see it. Based on the record that's been left behind for us, the geological record, we know that some sort of ecological crisis, probably a drought, and also invasion by another group, caused them to abandon their territory. They then joined with other scattered Southwestern communities until they were discovered by the Spanish. And if you're wondering, that did not go well for them. Here's the Mesa Verde cliff dwellings of the Anasazi. They're just amazing, the things that they built. Here's Pueblo Benito all these ruins that remain of their culture. Um, here's another view in Pueblo Benito. So amazing architecture. Oh, another culture is the Mississippian culture, which is actually a bunch of different cultures. So the Mississippians were actually multiple nations that had a similar culture and they probably originally came from some common ancestors. They date back to around the 7th or 8th century. Three different innovations led to a powerful new culture which developed. So there was the spread of the maize farming from the west to the east, the spread of the bow and arrow from the west to the east, and also the development of flint hoes. Previously, cultures used digging sticks for their agriculture, but using flint to make hoes is a much better tool. So the Mississippian culture is dozens of city-based communities, each with thousands of residents. When you picture the United States before Europeans arrived, it wasn't a barren wasteland. It wasn't a pristine, empty continent. It was full of cities and humans. 
the Mississippians built large mounds in the center of most of their cities. So they had kind of a distinctive city style. Their cities were loosely united at best, despite sharing a common culture. There's evidence that there was frequent warfare over river access. Many of the larger city-states dominated the smaller, and they forced them to pay tribute. We have evidence of all this going on. The conditions eventually deteriorated, which led to the abandonment of many sites well before the Europeans arrived, although the Mississippian culture still existed. It didn't get completely wiped out. Now, we don't know what caused the abandonment of many sites. It could have been something climate-wise, you know, something weather-related. They could have had severe drought, flooding. There could have been other nations that were attacking them. We d could have been disease. We don't know. This is what their dwelling houses looked like. Now, this is a reconstruction based on drawings and based on some records that have been left behind, again, geological records, looking at the stones and what they can tell us. This is how they built their platform mounds. It's interesting that this mound shape is seen all over the U.S. And you also find this mound shape in other parts of the world. We know that they would bury some things in the mounds. They would also build the mounds over prior structures. But we don't really know exactly what purpose the mounds served in the center of their cities. Was it a center of worship? Was it a center of government? We don't know. We just make educated guesses. Um, here's a reconstructed temple at Angel Mounds, Indiana, which you can visit today. Etowah Mounds in Georgia, another series of mounds that you can visit. And here's some of the artifacts that have been dug out of the Etowah Mounds. Now, we only have our best guesses for what these were used for. So people always automatically make the assumption that these represent gods, but you don't know for sure. After all, think about what a culture might guess about us if we were suddenly wiped out and all we left behind were artifacts. They might make very wrong conclusions about um, toilets, for example. They might see that we have a separate room in every house, sometimes multiple rooms, all bearing the same object, and they might assume it's a god. And in reality, it's a toilet. So you don't want to jump to assumptions that everything is a god or is for religion when you find these art pieces from cultures. It, it could be, but it could represent rulers. It could represent specific people who were highly respected, could have been teaching tools. They might have used them in some sort of ceremony. We don't know. Uh, one famous area that you can still visit today is Moundville, right on the Black Warrior River near present-day Tuscaloosa. Moundville dates back to the from the 11th to the 16th centuries. We have an artist's depiction of what it might have looked like. And of course, here's what you can actually see today in Moundville. It's pretty well organized. Clearly, there was a thought process into how things were laid out. Uh, another famous site is Cahokia. Cahokia is in Illinois near present-day St. Louis, right alongside the Mississippi River. Dates back to the 13th century. And here again, artist interpretation of what it might have looked like. And here's part of what remains in Cahokia, what they call Monk's Mound. You think about all the work that went into building these. Uh, here's another view of Monk's Mound. It's really quite beautiful. So what do we know about the 13th century life on the Mississippi? Cahokia was likely one of the largest pre-Columbian cities. Pre-Columbian means before Columbus. It was possibly a city-state based on the number of people that lived there. Uh, the population was probably somewhere between 20,000 to 30,000 people at its largest. This is based on burials and, and other evidence that we've been able to find. It was a planned city. And the reason we call it a planned city is 
based on how organized the architecture is and how definite some of the measurements are, it's evident that they actually planned this before they built it. They didn't just build it as they needed it. There was a temple plaza at the center, which was 15 acres wide at its base, that was oriented using sight lines and positions of the sun, moon, and stars to determine the direction accurately. So there's evidence that they're using astrology of some sort. Um, west of Monk's Mound, there's a circle of tall posts which use the position of the rising sun to mark the summer and winter solstices and the spring and fall equinoxes. So they're using their architecture to actually mark the passage of time. And probably a large part of why they would want to do that is for their agriculture. They had a complex society that established trade and possibly demanded tribute from smaller cities based on what we've seen from similar cultures. It was built on a floodplain, but this seems to be deliberate. And of course, that poses the question of why. Maybe that made the soil more full of nutrition for agriculture. Um, that's one of the best guesses that I've read. It may have also been a city used in religious pilgrimages, and they make that guess just based on evidence that this was traveled to regularly. There is also possible evidence that there may have been ritual human sacrifice here, but we don't know for certain. These are some of the artifacts found from Cahokia. So arrowheads, hooks, so evidence that they were fishing, spheres and other hunting evidence. Um, you have a sculpture here, mother nursing her child. We don't know if this was a significant woman or if it just was a female figure in general. It's also carvings, other sculptures. Sculptures give us an idea of how the common people probably appeared. And so I end by bringing us back to those original questions. Who was here first? What were their settlements like? What was their culture? What happened to them? Well, as you saw, there were, there were quite a few people here first. In terms of where in the, in the present day United States, it appears that the first cultures emerged in the Southwest, which is kind of interesting because that's largely desert. It's less hospitable for farming. So it's interesting that some of these harder to settle areas actually saw human settlement first, at least as far as the geological record shows. Now you gotta remember the East Coast of the United States gets a lot more rain, saw a lot more warfare. So it's entirely possible there was earlier culture on that side and it just got erased. As for what their settlements were like, they had cities and city-states, they built temples, they built all sorts of different types of dwellings as we've seen. Their cultures, many of the cultures developed agriculture. Um, some cultures, which we don't really have much evidence to tell us about, were hunter-gatherer. And as for what happened to them, some cultures died out when they encountered the Europeans. There was an outright genocide in some cases. But other cultures disappeared long before the Europeans got here. There were situations like drought, possibly disease, and of course other cultures absorbed them or conquered them.